In order to talk about the remake of The Blob from 1988, I have to go back to, where else? The 1958 original. In the early 1950s, Jack H. Harris wanted to get out of film distribution and into producing. He discussed his formula for the perfect feature with Irvin H. Milgate, who is the head of visual aids for the Boy Scouts of America. Harris said, It's gotta be a monster movie. It's gotta be in color instead of black and white. It can't be a cheapy creepy. It's gotta have some substance to it. It's gotta have characters you can believe in. And there's gotta be a unique monster, something never done before. I wanted to do things that'll undo mankind if it's not arrested or destroyed. The method of killing the monster would have to be something Grandma could have cooked up on her stove. Milgate spent the next year trying to think of something until finally it dawned on him. He called Harris at 3 a.m. and said, I've got it! The Molten Meteor! A mineral life form that consumes flesh on contact. You can't burn it, you can't reduce it with acid, and you can't shoot it. There's only one thing you can do. Freeze it. That makes it immobile. Harris loved the idea and pitched it to Valley Forge Films, a production company in Chester Springs, Pennsylvania. They liked it and put it into production in the summer of 1957. While production continued, there were a number of potential titles they considered. Absorbing Senior, The Night of the Creeping Dead, The Glob That Girdled the Globe, The Glob, and then finally, The Blob. It was filmed mostly on sound stages at Valley Forge Studios, as well as some locations around Royersford and Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. The blob itself was made out of silicone, which was a new thing at the time. They discovered they could achieve different degrees of consistency with it, which made it the perfect substance for them to use. They also used a half-inflated weather balloon, which they covered in the gel. They added vegetable coloring to give it the reddish tint. The blob got redder and redder as it grew and ate more people. The color was a bit of a chore since they had to keep mixing the substance since the dye would always settle to the bottom. The movie took 31 days to shoot and then 9 months in post for them to do the effects. The Blob was released on September 10, 1958. It was a low-budget independent creature feature that went on to be a surprise hit. It was also the first lead role for actor Steve McQueen, who would go on to be one of the biggest stars in the world at the time. In 1972, the sequel, Beware the Blob, also known as Son of the Blob, was released. While the first was a horror movie, this sequel tried to be more of a horror spoof. It failed miserably and was the first and last film directed by Larry Hagman. There had been a few failed attempts at doing a remake of the original over the years, but nothing ever came of them. That is, until the late 1980s. The Blob became a staple of creature features on television, which was how aspiring director Chuck Russell saw it. Russell was born in Park Ridge, Illinois in May of 1958, the same year that The Blob was released. He grew up with a love of movies and worked on a variety of films while trying to make a name for himself. He was a producer on The Great American Girl Robbery and a second assistant director on Chatterbox. In 1980, while working as an executive producer on Hell Night, he met production assistant Frank Darabont. The two hit it off and became friends. Russell was writing various scripts at the time, and one of them was picked up and turned into the movie Dreamscape. While he was happy to sell a script, Russell really wanted to direct. He now had plenty of experience in the industry and was looking for a break in the business, but wasn't having any luck. He had meetings with various studios to present his original ideas, but none of them were interested. It was then he realized the full extent of commercialism in Hollywood. Originality wasn't going to get him as far as he first thought, and so he had to shift tactics. No one wanted original ideas. They wanted something with a name they could sell. One night while flipping through TV stations, Russell stumbled on the end of the blob. This reminded him of the film, and he thought it was ripe for an update. While he enjoyed the original, he felt there were many things he could do to improve upon it. He said, Everyone else in the 50s was making movies about aliens that were smart enough to build flying saucers, and all they really wanted to do was kill teenagers when they got to Earth. Jack Harris and his people had a film with a really alien creature. They hit on something that struck a primal chord. This thing is relentless and predatorial. You can't reason with it. You can't get away from it. He went to meet with Jack Harris, the producer of the original, who owned the rights after buying them back from Paramount in the 1960s. Russell spoke to Harris and said, I have no money and nothing special to show you, but here's this script I'm writing. Harris was impressed with his ideas and sold him the remake rights for very little money. Russell and Darabont shared a mutual respect for writing, so the two joined together to work as a team. The duo became writing partners and put together a treatment for a blob remake. When writing with Darabont, Russell wanted the movie to be amped up. He thought, 
Let me take the concept of the blob to its furthest extent, to do things that weren't possible in 1958. They were going to make the film at Roger Corman's New World Pictures, but that stalled. So they started to see if they could do this elsewhere. They met with several studios who weren't interested. During this time, New Line Cinema was working on A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. After the critical failure of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, the studio was unsure about how to move the franchise forward. Wes Craven wasn't involved with Part 2, and they asked him to return for Part 3 so he could end the series. Craven co-wrote a script with Bruce Wagner, but had no intention of directing since he already signed on to make Deadly Friend. John Saxon and Robert England both presented scripts, but the studio didn't like either of them. New Line went looking for a director and contacted Joseph Rubin, who directed Dreamscape. They thought Dreamscape had a similar vibe to the Nightmare series, and Rubin would be a good choice to take over. Rubin was already working on his next movie, The Stepfather, so he declined. He did, however, suggest the writer of Dreamscape, Chuck Russell. Russell and Darabont had a meeting with Bob Shea, the head of New Line, to try and sell him on the idea of the Blob remake. New Line wasn't interested in the Blob, but they did like their presentation, and offered Russell a job to direct A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Russell wasn't going to pass up this opportunity, so he took the job and figured if the movie was successful, he might be able to make the Blob his second film. Russell and Darabont completely overhauled the Craven script and made A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. The film was a monster hit grossing over $44 million, which was almost as much as the first two movies combined. Russell went back to Bob Shea at New Line and suggested the Blob remake, which he passed on. Since A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 was such a hit, they wanted him to direct Part 4. Determined to make his version of the Blob, Russell passed and started looking for a studio that might be interested. While this was going on, David Cronenberg's The Fly remake was released. It was both a critical and financial success which helped Russell when he was trying to sell his idea of a Blob remake. It proved you could take an idea from a niche classic, expand upon it, and make it a hit. He was able to get producers Elliot Kasner and Andre Blay involved, which gave him enough money to continue. Since they were able to secure enough producers to fund the film, they made a deal with TriStar Pictures for distribution. Now with a home, they were able to move forward with the production. When on the topic of remakes, Russell said he's of the school of thought that if you have nothing to add, then you shouldn't do it. He said, I wouldn't have touched King Kong. That's a picture I love. That's why he chose The Blob to remake. He felt the original idea was excellent, but then it could do with a more serious update. He wanted to make a film that respected the original, but was also its own thing, and not just a lazy retread of a 1950s classic. Russell and Darabont wanted to make some changes to the story, so it wasn't just the same movie with a new coat of paint. They took several key moments, but then changed most everything else. Another big change was the origin of the Blob. They wanted this version to be about biological warfare, rather than an alien. So initially you think it's an alien, but then you discover it's a government project going wrong. Russell didn't want to beat the audience over the head and make the film too political. He just made it a subtle jab at the government. For the cast, they want to include a wide variety of character actors. Billy Beck, Candy Clark, Joe Seneca, Art LaFleur, Paul McCrane, Sharon Spellman, Frank Collison, and more. Del Close was hired to play Reverend Meeker. Russell knew him as one of the cast from the comedy troupe Second City. Close was a friend and mentor to John Belushi and Bill Murray. What Russell didn't know at the time was that Close was in the Blob sequel, Beware the Blob. Close was a huge horror fan and was overjoyed to be offered a role in the Blob. He said they essentially approached him and asked him, Do you want to play a crazy reverend in the remake of the Blob? Beyond Beware the Blob, Close also had another tie to the 1958 film. Anita Corso, who played Jane in the original, was his high school sweetheart. Russell was a big fan of Eraserhead, so he hired Jack Nance to play the small part of the Doctor. They tried to get Chad McQueen, Steve McQueen's son, for the part of Brian Flagg, the bad kid. He turned it down. Richard Grieco almost got the part, but ultimately they decided to go with Kevin Dillon. Many people think the last name Flagg was Darabont including a Stephen King reference, but in reality... That was a name Russell put in there, and has nothing to do with the stand. A young unknown Terry Hatcher was a favorite for the role of Meg, but they decided to give the part to Shawnee Smith. They felt she was more down to earth, and would fit the part better. Also, she had guts, and they thought she could more convincingly pull off her character's transformation towards the end of the film. Donovan Leach Jr. was hired to play Paul. He was the son of the famous 60s musician Donovan, who had major hits like Mellow Yellow, Sunshine Superman, Atlantis, and others. 
Ricky Paul Golden was hired as Scott, the jerky friend. Bill Mosley was hired for the small part of Soldier No. 2. This was just a short time after he played Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Jeffrey DeMunn was the last-minute replacement. He got the call on a Saturday to play the sheriff and flew in on Sunday while reading the script on the airplane. When location scouting, Russell wanted the town to have one main road that essentially had everything. They found that place, which was Abbeville, Louisiana. They took Abbeville and renamed it to Arborville. They planned to do the first part of the shoot in Abbeville and then move to sets in California. Russell wanted the film to have great effects, but it had to be scary. That was most important. For the effects leader, they hired Lyle Conway. Conway designed the Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horrors, which got him an Oscar nomination for Best Visual Effects. Since his expertise was making things full-sized, he came in and wanted to do most of the effects full-scale. The director didn't like that because at full-scale, the weight of the blob was too heavy and would make it difficult to manipulate. While Conway handled the large-scale blob, they had Tony Gardner and his team handle the miniatures. When working on the blob, Conway said, Look, I don't want any conversation about what the blob is thinking right now. It doesn't think. It eats. Initially, Russell thought it would be fun if the blob was green. He then decided that since this thing was absorbing people, it should be reddish pink like the original. The effects team watched the original and agreed it was just jello. They needed a proper substance for this version, and after trying a variety of gels and chemicals, they went with a substance called methicil. Methicil is a thickening agent, commonly used in things like milkshakes. This stuff could be mixed to be as thick or as thin as they needed. Also, it doesn't dry up, so it was great for making blobs. Once they had some, it would stay sticky and blob-like for as long as they needed. The only problem was controlling it. What are we going to do to make it move? They created these bags called blob quilts or prom dresses. The prom dresses were made out of silk parachute-like material, airbrushed with details like veins. The silk bags were then filled with methicil and worked so well because it made the blob controllable while simultaneously being able to keep its shape. Once they painted the bags, they filled them with methicil through a syringe. Eventually, the goop would seep through the bags, which worked to hide them. So you couldn't see the bags anymore just the veins they painted that would come through the transparency of the liquid. So now they had these blobs of various sizes they could puppeteer around. Some they used by just having one of the animators control it by putting his hands underneath. Other times, for the larger blobs, they had the effects guys get under these huge blob bags and control them that way. Russell hired Mark Irwin, who was the DP for Cronenberg's The Fly, as well as many other Cronenberg movies. The Fly remake was such a good experience, he was intrigued when Russell asked him to shoot the blob. In the early design stages for the blob, the director wasn't entirely sold on what was being made. He met with the effects team to discuss what he wanted. He said, here's the rules of blobbery. He took out a piece of paper and drew a commandment tablet. One, you shall always be muscular. It has to feel like a tense muscle. It can't just be there like a sack of blubber. Two, you shall always be aggressive. It has to be a predatory thing, always looking for a target. Three, you shall always be busy. If nothing else, it shouldn't have any part that just lays there slack. It should always be moving. Michael Fink, the visual effects supervisor, took the paper and had t-shirts with the rules on it made for the crew. The Blob started filming on January 12, 1988. It was a crew of young independents, so spirits were high. Everyone was excited about the film. There was an energy on set, with lots of the effects people making some amazing things that had never been done before. They discovered it was hard to have a full-scale blob with the actors, so you never see them with a full-sized one. Whenever it was just the blob, it was Lyle Conway. Whenever it was the blob and humans, it was Tony Gardner. While the director wanted the movie to have some comedic elements, he wanted to make sure the blob itself was never silly. He said if it's silly, it's not scary. With something like the blob, it would be too easy to slip into parody. He wanted it to be like a force of nature. Not evil, just something that didn't care. It had no conscience and was driven by one need. The need to consume. When Donovan and Shawnee showed up on set, they laughed because they were playing high school kids going to a dance. In real life, just a few years earlier, they went to the prom together at Hollywood High, which is a real place I had to look it up. They did their best to make it look like summer, which was difficult since they were filming in the winter. It was January and 30 degrees on a warm day. They had the actors chew ice cubes before their scenes so we wouldn't see their breath. 
The stick the can man holds was a fiberglass stick with air bladders to make the blob move. They used wires and gravity to pull the blob away from the hand. They ran the footage in reverse to make it look like it was attacking the hand. When working on the film, Russell said, What is an X rating? It comes down to blood. So while we see some horrific things in the movie, there isn't a lot of blood. They tried to make it clear the blob was attracted to the blood from the bum's hand. With the blob wanting to eat the blood, it eliminated the need for blood spray, which ensured they'd be able to get an R rating. When the blob's going into the sewers, the camera pans up to a matte painting of the town. For the scientists that arrived later in the film, they needed to be in biohazard suits, but had two major problems. The glass in the helmets fogged up, and if they shined light at the actors' faces, there was a glare. To fix the first problem, they designed the helmets to have vents that would make it so the glass wouldn't fog. The second was a little trickier. After trying a few options, they found the best was to use a chimsel. Chimsel's an acronym for Center High Mounted Stop Lamp, the middle light you see on the back of cars. They rigged the helmets to have a chimsel that would shine light and illuminate their faces without causing a glare. They had them wired up into the suit with batteries in their backpacks. When the blob fills Dr. Meadow's helmet, they did that with a balloon. The field where they had the science station was the same one where they shot E.T. The motorcycle jump was an insane stunt. They planned to have Flag jump the broken bridge while being chased by the government vehicles and even a helicopter. They had a stuntman who was going to ride the motorcycle, and he was a younger circus performer who was an expert. He jumped the bridge, and when he landed, both tires on the bike blew out. The kid was a pro, and he put his feet down and used his upper body strength to keep it from falling over as he drove off. The director loved it and wanted to keep that in the movie, but they had to cut to the actor driving away because they needed the bike to have its tires for the rest of the movie. So they got this incredible shot with the motorcycle jumping the gap and had the truck and helicopter in frame. All of this was in camera. Today, as per the director, this would all just be CG. Some of the things in the movie were based on Russell's friends he grew up with. The character of Scott was based on a kid he used to know in high school. The ribbed story was a true story from another kid in his high school. Flag wasn't meant to be an anti-hero, just a reluctant hero. Russell modeled him after another kid he went to high school with. He was a good kid at heart, but was in trouble all the time, which I'm sure most of us know someone like that. Russell likes the idea of the everyman versus a greater evil. It shows the hero in all of us. They wrote the characters in the movie not to be idiots. No one really does anything stupid that causes them to die. He wanted the audience to care about the characters, so when they did die, it was sad, rather than, oh, they deserve that. Russell wanted its movements to be unpredictable. Looks-wise, he wanted it to resemble a tumor and a jellyfish. R&D was difficult, but they had an incredible team. They had lots of trial and error. They needed to be able to have greater control over the tentacles, so there were wires that they puppeteered. They had thoughts about the blob, like are you still alive as you're being digested? In the original, we never see what happens after someone's caught in the slime. They took this opportunity to show the blob absorbing people. The director described the blob as an inside-out vampire stomach. If you touched it, it immediately would start pulling you in to digest. It dissolves organic material. To find out how people look when they're eaten, they took life casts and gelatin and melted them. Originally, that's what they were going to use, but it was too liquidy. It looked like someone melting, not someone being digested into the blob. They did use the aftermath for the puddle people, which were the ones at the end of the movie. While putting together the structure of the film, they came up with the deaths. Many were based on common fears. A big one was the fear of the garbage disposal. So they put in a death where a guy gets pulled into the garbage disposal. Darabont questioned this. How does a whole guy go down the drain? They worked it so he was being dissolved as the blob pulled him down. They had a mannequin with a false head and shoulders. The stunt guy was doing a handstand in the sink with blob bits glued to his face. He jumped from his handstand out of the sink, which they then ran in reverse to make it look like he was being pulled in. They pulled stuff off his face, which in reverse made it look like it was going on. When Meg and Brian are running away from the blob on the ceiling, they had the actors on a treadmill running away from a green screen. The guy being absorbed on the ceiling was a foam latex skin over the mechanically articulated body of a person. While writing the script, Russell wanted to emulate Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. In Psycho, you think Janet Leigh is going to be the protagonist, but in a shocking twist, she gets killed at the end of the first act. He wanted to make the movie something completely unexpected. Many remakes just copy-paste the script 
and give the audience the same movie as before, just with different actors and updated effects. He wanted to completely catch the audience off guard. Here you have a good-looking football player, who the audience thinks is going to be doing the Steve McQueen role. Only shortly into the film, he has one of the worst screen deaths in the entire thing. The setup of the remake was similar to the original, which was intentionally done to shock the viewer. If he dies, who's safe? It made it so now the audience has no idea who would live or die. Even kids weren't safe. The producers told Russell he couldn't kill kids in the movie. He laughed and said, Just watch me. Russell wanted Paul's death in the film to look the absolute best, since he would be the first person we see to die by the blob. The bum's the first victim, but we don't see him being killed. We just see the aftermath. They scheduled Paul's death to be the last effect they filmed. That way they could take everything they learned up to that point to make the effect the best it could be. If Paul's death was outstanding looking from a visual perspective, it would set the tone for the rest of the film. The locals loved having the movie shot in their small town, and many of them were involved in the film in one way or another, mostly as extras. The crew ate at the main restaurant and the road pretty much every day. For the blob-killing Scott, they had the car on a gimbal, which they flipped on its side and poured the liquid blob all over the actor. Many of the interiors were sets. The inside of the diner was filmed in a warehouse they converted to look like the diner. The friction between Russell and Conway continued during the shoot. Lyle Conway left the production once principal photography was done, which shifted all the work over to special effects designer Tony Gardner, who was now the head of the blob shop. Even though he was relatively young, he was more than up to the task. Tony Gardner trained under Rick Baker when he was 19, with his first job working on Michael Jackson's Thriller. He was only supposed to work with him for four weeks, but it turned into several years. Gardner just worked on Return of the Living Dead, Aliens, and The Lost Boys. Gardner was more on board with how Russell wanted to do things. For the phone booth sequence, they had a full-scale one and a half-scale miniature. For the full-scale one, they had the actress get inside while they draped the blob over it. Candy Clark was laughing because she felt silly and thought there was no way this could be scary. When she sees the dead sheriff, they built a fish tank that they filled with blob liquid and inserted a partially melted dummy of the actor, which was just the head and shoulders of the sheriff. They wanted to make sure the audience knew who it was, so they moved his badge way up, almost on his shoulder, to make sure it was properly in frame. When the blob breaks through the glass, they had the overhead establishing shot of the full-scale booth with the actress, and then they moved to the miniature, with a three-foot-tall dummy of the actress. Outside the booth, they had air mortars filled with blob goo that they fired at the booth, while the camera was recording at 120 frames per second. The scene as it comes together is just brutal. <laughs> Russell was interested in CG at the time. It was just starting to become a tool, but for what they needed, it just wasn't quite there yet. He had the effects team investigate, but it wasn't feasible. They did have two minor CG shots in the film. The frozen blob crystals were made out of resin, and they added the twinkle with very, very early CG in post. The sewer scenes were all done in a set, which was one of the most expensive things they built in the film. They had this massive set filled with water where they hid air mortars to simulate the blob moving. In the sewer sequence, no one wanted to get in the water. Trudging through there for hours was quite a workout, especially for the crew. When the kid gets pulled under, they used Bobby Porter, a little person stuntman. At first, when he gets pulled, it's so fast, so you can't tell. And then when he comes back up, he has the melted makeup on, to disguise it's not the actor. The sewer blob was one of the mechanical ones. They had it rigged, and while it was cool, it stood out, and it was a little more obvious than the others that it wasn't organic. The flower blob, as they called it, was about a foot and a half tall. The dead girl in the theater was based on Tony Gardner's wife as a gag. She got a kick out of it and couldn't wait to see her mother's reaction. On set, they had 55-gallon drums of methicil on hand that they scooped out and used as needed. Some of the larger blobs weighed hundreds of pounds. Every morning, they'd go in and reinflate the blobs. For the huge blobs, they had what they called a turtle rig, which was a fiberglass turtle shell that an unlucky effects guy would get under, and they'd drape the blob over them. They'd stick their arms out at certain points so they could move the blob around. Tony Gardner suggested they hire Noble Craig, a triple amputee that he worked with in Poltergeist 2. He storyboarded a scene where Meg gets a gun from a half-dissolved agent, and Russell loved it. There were some things that had to be dropped either for time or budget. 
There was a sequence where Flag is trapped in a truck by the blob. He looks out the windshield and sees numerous half-digested bodies floating through the blob. They build all these skeleton props stretched out and place them in a tank filled with milk and food coloring. They want to show the dissolving corpse of Dr. Meadows float by outside the window. They set up the tank and filled it so they could shoot the next day. Unfortunately, it leaked overnight, and the next day the tank was completely empty. There was blob water everywhere. They had to scrap the scene because it would have taken too long to reset, and in the end, it wasn't essential to the story. There was a scene in the script where Flag needed to drive through a sewer pipe and around the blob. They hired a team of three Italian bike racers who did the Globe Circus Act. They told them they could do a complete 360 in the pipe if it was built correctly. They each tried, but couldn't do a full 360, so they only did a partial spin, which was still very dangerous. Del Close used to hang out in the effects department and would tell the crew old Belushi stories. The effects work was very difficult. Sometimes it took 12 hours to set up one shot. Russell was a producer by trade, so he knew how they operated. Towards the end of production, there were two big effects shots that took all day. These were the ones where the blob was on Main Street. He looked at the dailies, and they didn't work. He said, we gotta do this again, let's try one more time. They got a call from the producers who said to move on. Russell still wanted the shots, so he knew how to fix this. He told the effects guys to go set up the shots, and said, no one answer the phone. They got the shots they needed, and then answered the phone. The blob that rises out of the sewer, they called the Christmas tree an ironing board blob. In a nice little show of how much attention to detail the effects crew did, right before the agent gets crushed by the blob, he pulls the tabs on his grenade vest. Then when Brian runs past, you can see these two small explosions within the blob go off. It's also a little of that dark humor, because this guy wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. But in the end, it was something that ultimately had no effect on the blob, and most people watching even missed it. The basement door Meg and the kids are running away from was a miniature door they fired a blob at with an air cannon. They found KY was similar to methicil, so they used that for some of the shots. They sent runners to get cases of condoms and lube, which got them some really weird looks at the local stores. What kind of movie are you people making? When the blobs over Paul, they were dripping acid onto a tabletop made out of styrofoam. For the scene where the blob falls on Paul, they did it by taking a piece of the ceiling and putting it on the floor. They then placed the camera above it, facing down. They had a couple of the crew hold one of the blob bags, and then dropped it on the ceiling. They then ran that footage in reverse. Since they moved Paul's death to almost the end of filming, that meant it was up to Tony Gardner and his team to handle it. Although by this point, like the director wanted, they had experimented with so many different blob techniques, they were able to make this frightening effect. They had one of the blob bags that they pulled over the actor. That really is him in there. He was afraid because as they pulled the blob back, all the goop was going up his nose and into his mouth. They had oxygen nearby in case of emergency. The blob was still semi-transparent since it hadn't absorbed that much blood. They didn't tell Shawnee Smith what was going to happen to Donovan, so when she walks in, her reaction was genuine. She said it was terrifying. When it cuts to a wider shot, it's a miniature of Meg pulling his arm. They really went the extra mile with the effect. Beyond showing Paul being absorbed, you can see the blob escaping out the back window. The passed out girl in the car with Scott was a pre-Baywatch Erica Laniac. When the kid's eating the jello, it was an homage to the original blob. Russell has a cameo in the movie theater as the guy in the green plaid shirt. The stinger at the end was something they filmed long after first unit was done. They had a rear projection of the preacher delivering his lines. Then they moved a prosthetic arm into place holding a jar with the blob in it. There was a cable running through the arm into the jar that made it move around. The ending wasn't so much a cliffhanger, just a little tease. Darabont swears the ending wasn't a setup for a sequel. He said, I'll probably have it carved on my gravestone. I swear to God it wasn't a setup for a sequel. While Russell had an idea for a sequel, he wanted to focus on making the first movie as good as it could be. Then, if it succeeded and audiences wanted it, he'd focus more on his idea. He felt the most important thing was for this movie to be as good as they could make it, before worrying about a sequel. The DP said the hardest thing about the shoot was making the blob look the same from the beginning to the end, because it's made of so many different things. Miniatures, half-scale, full-scale, shooting underwater, shooting at night, sometimes it's a puppet, sometimes it's being fired out of a cannon. It's hard to get it to look like the same stuff. The schedule was insane. They filmed from January to May, and the studio wanted the film to be out as soon as possible. 
They insisted this was a summer movie and really rushed them to get it done. They were still shooting second unit when the film was being edited. They worked incredibly long hours and were able to get the film finished in time for the planned release. The movie opened on August 5th, 1988 in eighth place. It was only in theaters for two weeks, making a little over $8 million domestically. It opened up against Cocktail, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Die Hard, Coming to America, A Fish Called Wanda, Midnight Run, and Big. Going up against that lineup, it's not hard to see why it was overlooked. Although there was another reason. The studio, TriStar, was changing hands at the time, and the new owners didn't want to support a movie they had no involvement in. Consequently, it had a dismal release with next to no marketing. The studio was changing hands, and the new executives didn't care about the old movies. They only wanted to focus on the new films that they'd be working on. The movie was only released into about a thousand theaters, while others were getting anywhere between 1,400 and 1,700. It was rumored the film was much more expensive, somewhere in the 20 million range. But Russell said the film's budget was actually under 10 million dollars. Even still, they did not make their money back initially. While the movie flopped in theaters, it did much better on home video, which was where most of its fans now saw the film. Jack Harris really liked it. He enjoyed seeing all the creativity and inventiveness put into the remake. Russell sees it as a high school movie. The kids are the heroes and the adults are mostly the bad guys. He also wrote this partially as his own personal fantasy. The outcast kid saves his town and gets the girl. Shawnee Smith was offered her role in Who's Harry Crumb because the director was a fan of her work in The Blob. Years later, she was cast in the movie Saw. James Wan and Lee Whannell admitted they had a crush on her in The Blob, which was one of the reasons they wanted her for the movie. Initially, she turned the role down because she thought the movie was too violent. They managed to convince her, and she'd go on to have a recurring role in one of the most successful horror franchises of the 2000s. She appeared in conventions and was surprised to see how many people were talking about the Blob. She had no idea it had such a strong cult following. People brought her Blob merchandise to sign, which made her happy. She was excited because she loved the movie, even though she's not a fan of horror movies. Not that she thinks they're bad, just that she scares easy. So it's funny that she keeps finding herself being cast in horror films. Frank Darabont is going on to make numerous adaptations of Stephen King, most famously The Shawshank Redemption, The Green Mile, in The Mist, he went on to develop, write, and produce the insanely successful TV series, The Walking Dead. He's since been nominated for three Oscars. He frequently hires Jeffrey DeMunn, who he met on The Blob. Russell said the movie was a huge labor of love for all involved. This was an independent film distributed by a studio that initially cared, but then was taken over by people who didn't. After the movie was released, Russell said, Maybe it was a mistake to do a remake of The Blob with a sense of humor. I thought it would be an entertaining interpretation. Unfortunately, it was released in a very hectic summer, filled with big gems, and it didn't have a particularly good ad campaign. It's tough to do epitaphs, and I hate being put in a position to defend it after the fact. It's still out there. You can rent it and decide for yourself. I like the film. While New Line said no to The Blob, they later said yes to Chuck Russell directing The Mask, where he was able to use some revolutionary CG. While CG wasn't ready when he did The Blob, he was able to envision and do many of the things he wanted in The Mask. A lot of the crew from The Blob went on to Ghostbusters 2. The town hall was a huge miniature, built on an angle, so The Blob could slide down it. They used the same technique to get the slime to go over the museum in Ghostbusters 2. Tony Gardner continues to be one of the most in-demand makeup effects designers in everything from Hocus Pocus to Batman and Robin to Zombieland. He runs Alterian Inc., an L.A.-based effects studio he founded in 1984. Del Close died in 1999 of emphysema. He loved the theater, and as per his will, he left his skull to the Goodman Theater to use it for productions of Hamlet. The Goodman Theater was a theater he used to teach at. In 2006, the authenticity of the skull came into question, and after some investigation, they found out that the actor's skull had been cremated along with the rest of him, and the skull at the theater was a fake. It turned out, after Dell's death, his partner requested they remove his head, and they laughed at her. She contacted the Illinois Society of Pathologists, but they also refused. After two days, she reluctantly had his full body cremated. She bought the skull at an anatomical chart company to give to the theater in its place without telling them what happened. Now that the truth is out, most of Dell's friends understand, and even though the skull at the theater isn't his, 
they still treat it like it is. Close believe the Garden Tool Massacre, the movie within the movie, was a reference to the Toolbox Murders, which featured Anita Corso from the original Blob. In 1999, there was the first Blob Fest. Blob Fest is an annual three-day event each summer in downtown Phoenixville at the Colonial Theater, which was the theater from that famous scene in the original movie. The festival features multiple screenings of the Blob and other horror films. They also have a film competition, scream contest, street fair, and live entertainment during the weekend. The biggest part of the festival is a live reenactment of the famous scene filmed at the Colonial, with screaming movie patrons escaping through the front doors of the theater. In 2007, after the success of Rob Zombie's remake of Halloween, the director was approached to helm a remake of The Blob. He had all sorts of ideas on how to make it different than both the original and the remake. He said, That gigantic jello-looking thing might have been scary to audiences in the 1950s, but people would laugh now. I have a totally different take that's going to be pretty dark. Some concept art was uncovered a few years ago showing his ideas. Apparently a blob monolith was turning people and the dead into blob mutants. One of the people fighting the mutants off was most likely his wife, Sherry Moon Zombie. After years of development hell, Zombie left the production. He said he wanted to break away from anything relating to pre-existing material. The remake train was getting tired when he was doing Halloween, and everyone complained. He said, after all the years of not being able to win at Halloween, I just couldn't go through that again. The Blob remake then passed on to director Simon West, who eventually left it as well. In 2020, the producers tried to revive the second remake, but it was delayed due to COVID. There's now a legal fight over the rights ownership between the producers who haven't been able to get the film made in well over a decade, despite owning the rights, and Worldwide Entertainment Corporation, which is currently run by Judith Harris the widow of Jack Harris, who died in 2017. Russell said he wouldn't mind seeing another remake with CG to compare how today's effects would hold up to his own. Russell is currently working on another remake. This time he's tackling the 80s horror film Witchboard. The Blob is one of the best creature features of the 80s. The Fly, The Thing, and The Blob are the all-time high-watermark trilogy of remakes. They each take their initial idea and bring many new things to the table that sets them apart from the original. The movie was vicious and caught audiences completely off guard. In the beginning, you think Johnny Football Hero is going to save the day, but nope, blob food. To me, that was one of the most shocking moments in movies. For fans of the original, they thought he was going to be this version Steve McQueen. For newcomers, seeing the handsome, likable kid get killed so brutally, it was unexpected to say the least. They made it so much like they wanted, to let the audience know that anything could happen. It takes a lot of courage to kill off a major character that early in the film and then shift the story over to someone who you think is going to be a problem. Then you think maybe the good-hearted sheriff is going to save the day, but nah. Beyond that, the effects are fantastic. There are some compositing issues, but overall, the creativity and imagination put into the creature make it easy to overlook those issues. The Blob 1988 is one of the best examples of how to do a proper remake. I appreciate all the love and care that went into this. You can watch the original and the remake back to back and have two distinctly different experiences. It's a film that very much stands on its own. I'm glad that it found its audience, and I'm happy to hear that Russell's still very proud of it. He should be. I really don't want another remake. Much like Russell said about King Kong, I don't think there's anything they could do now that would set this apart. They most likely would go back and retell the original story, and the only difference would be a CG blob. No thanks. Hi everyone. Way back in 2011, I was working on a Good Bad Flicks episode of The Blob. My parents were visiting, and while they were here, my dad had a stroke. I loaded him into my car, rushed him to the ER, and once we got there, he full-on went into seizures where they had to strap him down. The doctor told my mother that it wasn't looking good. Once he was stable, there wasn't anything I could do, so I went home, and as a way to get my mind off of things, I worked on the episode of The Blob. Not my best episode, but at the time, I was only a year into this and I still didn't really know what I was doing. I was in a haze for a few days and pretty much expected the worst. 
A few days later, I got a call that my dad was awake and in the hospital. He was confused, and they were as well. He was trying to leave and had no idea how he arrived there. He had no recollection of the past few days. They kept him there for a few days to monitor his state, but then let him go. They said he was a one in millions case. Not one in a million, one in millions. Normally, when someone has a stroke of this magnitude, they're often left in a vegetative state. He somehow managed to pull through with only some minor afflictions. So while I was overwhelmingly glad that he survived, it was a reminder that he could go at any moment. I'm forever glad that he survived because he was able to become a grandfather. My son was born in 2014, and he was able to be around to see him grow up for the next few years. My dad's a big sports nut, and around the end of May, he came out to see my son play Little League. A few weeks later was when I got a call about 3 a.m. from my mom saying that dad had another stroke and was being taken to the hospital. His condition fluctuated, and at one point it looked like he might pull out of it again, but finally his body gave out and took a turn for the worst, until he passed away on June 22nd. The Blob was one of the videos I had on the back burner as one I wanted to redo, so I'd been working on it uh, on and off over the years. Now with my dad gone, it seemed like the video I wanted to cover again since the last time I did this was when he had his first stroke. The original Blob has a special place in my heart because my dad loved it. It was filmed near where he spent a lot of time when he was young, in Phoenixville and Valley Forge. I even lived there in the late 90s, early 2000s, within walking distance of the Colonial Theater. Blobfest lit up the town every year. James, the angry video game nerd, did a video about it a few years ago. So doing this video was therapeutic. It gave me something to focus on while I was working through my grief. I hope you all enjoyed it. As I said in my statement back in July, your support has allowed me to do something to make my father proud, even if he never really understood what it is that I do. Thanks for your continued support over the years. Lots more to come. 